welcome to a new episode of the Exxon Magazine podcast. My name is Diana Olenik and today we're going to be speaking about Noun Town. Noun Town is the world's most advanced language learning software using motivating gameplay and cutting edge learning techniques to remove the green from learning a new language. Learn Japanese, Spanish, French, Italian, German and Chinese and even more languages have been added recently, leveraging the unique properties of VR. Because with this learning directly, you impact the game environment as well. As you progress, the island turns to color and the characters move back to the town. It's a whole unique experience. And of course, it's very fun and very enjoyable. Noun Town was created by Realia XR that grew out of pioneering academic research into learning foreign languages in virtual reality. So combined with the latest in XR technology, this results in an immersive embodied language learning experience like no other. Today we're going to be speaking about Noun Town with Jack Ratcliffe who is the creator of Noun Town VR language learning. This project is based off his PhD research into cognition in VR. By leveraging the properties unique to VR, Jack and his team are creating the new way to learn a second language. This is very, very exciting and I cannot wait to get started. Let's do it. Thank you so much, Jack, for being here today. We're super excited. How are you doing today, by the way? I am good, but a little tired. We've just launched again to another platform. So we just officially launched on Steam yesterday. And that's always oh. quite a exciting and stressful process. So it's nice to have it out. It's nice to have it receiving good reviews, but it would also be nice to like have a long bath and a long sleep. Oh, yes. Thank you. That's amazing news. Thank you so much for sharing that. Please let us know a little bit about maybe your background and how Noun Town got started. Yeah, so um, my background is uh, kind of varied. My my undergraduate way back in the past was in uh, English. So I've always been interested in like the language and the construct and the use of language. Um, but at the same time, I was always very technologically involved. I've been programming websites since I was like 10 or 11. Um, so at some point, all of my different strands turned into me working as a UX designer. And then that led to my PhD in virtual reality and uh, cognition. Um, so in my PhD, I was really looking into what it means to take actions in virtual reality, like what it, what an how our brains contextualize what an action is and what effect that has on how we think about things. Um, and I was using language learning to explore that. So as part of that process, I had to rapidly upskill on my understanding of applied linguistics and language learning techniques. Um, so I was able to do a lot of courses from a master's as part of my PhD in linguistics and applied linguistics. Um, and that kind of all amalgamated together to, to really like understand the approaches that work for teaching languages and how virtual reality was such a, a good match for those approaches and then naturally it seemed to be like okay actually a virtual reality language learning game could be a very powerful tool and it could be very effective compared with other technological interventions in the language learning space yeah it sounds exciting thank you so much for making such a lovely introduction it seems that you've been through, you know, the academy and studying kind of like the inner works of languages and the impact. So that's amazing because we can see then now how the foundations of Noun Town are done there a little bit like by through the research as well of how is that people learn more naturally about uh, languages. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we were trying to do is we, we looked at all the different uh, ways that people theorize that people learn the optimal methods for teaching and then we kind of tried to just we literally had a map where we kind of mapped those two features and functionalities of virtual reality and it quite quickly became clear that we could do most of the optimal forms in a system in virtual reality and that was just kind of a breakthrough moment for us we were like oh wow this could be really powerful and it's been it's been exciting building it and we've had testers and players all the time and uh, and then having them when we released having such positive feedback from people we were like ah oh, 
I'm so glad that our thought that this could work is actually turned into something where where people are feeling that kind of uh, efficacy come through. Mm, yeah, amazing. Okay, so I am myself a second language speaker. And when I was in high school or in my old school, I remember I had English classes. And I remember having these English classes, the tutor is there or the professor, the teacher is there. And then we go through a lot of exercises of grammatics. So it's like the formula that where the subject goes, where the verb goes, where, because in English is for a Spanish speaking person, it's the, the positions change sometimes based on the grammatical context. And at the end of high school, and even when I went to university, still I felt that all of these years I've been studying English and I still cannot speak English. Could you please let us know what is wrong there in that approach and where do you see it going? Because why yeah, I, we are still I, in this situation? I also <laughs> want to add a question back to you, which is, did you like those lessons? Like, did you find them enjoyable? No, it's a lot of, a lot of going through the exams, going through the, this actually is one of the things that I've always been passionate about revolutionary ways. I'm always the person that is thinking in another direction. In any group that I go, I kind of like always fight against the current systems because I already know that there is something that maybe could be better. So for me, it was hard. And I always thought, why education is like this? Actually, this is this is a lot, in, in my opinion, is a lot about the whole educational system, the ways that we are doing things right now. But because you're the expert and have research about this, I'm super, super excited to get to know, like, like pick your brain. <laughs> yeah, so so we, I think what you would have experienced um, was the grammar translation method of language teaching, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very traditional method. It's a very boring method. Um, and it doesn't really seem to have great outcomes. I mean, if you use language enough, you'll eventually learn it whichever way you are using it or learning it. Um, but I think everyone's looking for a way which is actually more effective and more fun because people want to get straight into languages. And if you look at language learning techniques nowadays, a lot of them do away with that kind of traditional approach. Um, and if you look at how people learn their first languages, it's, it's not done in that way. It's not like your parents go, right, this is the subject and this is the object mm -hmm. and this is what a verb is and this is a noun and construct it in that like totally alien to how we actually use and learn languages. So most of the modern approaches are things like task-based learning, where you actually have to use the vocabulary that you're learning and the sentences that you're learning to achieve a goal. And you kind of, that triggers all kinds of motivational and reward systems in the human brain. And that makes people want to continue learning. And also it makes it form a stronger memorization. And there's also other things like community of competence, the idea that the most important thing in language learning is not being to abstractly uh, translate between two pieces of text or understand the linguistic constructions in a second language, but actually to be able to communicate your wants and desires and hopes and thoughts and feelings to another human and have them communicate back to you. And whether that's just because you want to go into a coffee shop and order a coffee, or whether it's you want to express that you're having fun to your friends, the, the important thing is increasing the level of community competence that people feel. So we took those kind of approaches, predominantly community competence, predominantly task-based learning, and we thought, how could we kind of put all of this together in an experience that is really engaging for people and makes them want to continue because not only are those methods more motivating but they also seem to have better learning outcomes and that is what you'll find if you ask most language teachers today is those two things are, are quite or, or learning approaches similar to those are what are causing big positive results in learners so we try to take those put them in the game and also use other benefits of virtual reality like being immersed in a language, I think everyone knows that that is really powerful. I was talking to someone earlier today and she said she didn't speak any French until she moved there five years ago. And now she's fluent because she's surrounded by mm -hmm. uh, French speakers and the need for French speaking mm -hmm. um, and a French environment. So we put, we kind of looked at that as well. Um, there's a, a theory called the production effect, um, which is the idea that when you're trying to learn another language, 
actually saying it out loud makes it form stronger memorizations than if you're just reading it abstractly on a page. Uh, so we made sure that the majority of our interaction involved production by speaking. And uh, also there's a huge, huge sense of uh, production anxiety, it's called, which is when you learn something on paper, when you go to say that to someone for the first time, you kind of freeze up. It almost feels like your mouth is frozen solid, that you're unable to talk. And what we wanted to do is go, okay, it, it doesn't matter if you know the words, if you can't use them so straight away we want people saying the words having positive feedback being able to interact with our characters with sentences that they're saying in that language so that immediately when you go into the real world you're like i've been saying these things it's not there's not this big hurdle in my mouth that is stopping me um so they're they're kind of some of the approaches and i think that's a roundabout way of exploring some of the things that we're trying to do in in noun town yeah, thank you so much for expanding on that. It brings me memories of all of this process that I have undertaken myself learning languages. I really, uh, one thing that I like to to notice and, uh, and to highlight is, uh, as you mentioned, the way that children learn and is the fact that one of the things that for me, I analyze in my learning process um, that happen is that as adults, we are afraid of making the mistakes, whereas children just speak the words out and they are okay. We still understand them. And because there is no judgment in their mind of how that might be happening, they just try and try many times until the sound, it seems to sink somehow in the brain and you recognize it and now you speak freely. I remember when I was learning, and I'm going to make a confession here, this is, this is, um yeah, I've never said this before, I guess, but when I was learning English, I cried. I came to Canada and uh, I thought that I was going to be able to learn faster after all of these years. I even did a course uh, back home and then I came here confident. I said, oh yeah, with this course and everything, I'm going to be able to do it there because I'm an engineer and I'm going to be there continuing my profession. So that impactful it is to learn the language. Sometimes when you have to go to another country and the whole pretty much life now is going to depend on the language. And so I came here and, uh, and when I was at the, 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 the border, uh, the, the person, uh, the of officer asked me, um, a couple of questions about the, the visa, etc. And I didn't understand anything. It was super frustrating. He had to call an interpreter. And it was super sad for me. And that day I said, this is not looking good. <laughs> and it didn't look good later on because I signed onto a program and the program, um, I struggle a lot. And I, it had learners from other countries and mostly from China. It's even like that. It was super, super complicated. So one of the things that I noticed is that when I was reading, somehow I was, when reading, translating. But there was a shift that I cannot remember when that happened where I didn't translate anymore and I was understanding. I wonder if you could please explain us how that process happens and if that happens it's different with the new media ways to learn languages or or how does how what do you have to say about it yeah so first i want to say i'm sad to hear about your experience and i think that is like it's quite uh insightful in how it portrays how we're taught about languages and how we're taught we should learn them and how we should suddenly be able to do this because we've done it in some medium like doing a lot of reading or listening and that somehow we can do that in in like an actual situation um well i think that's that's very problematic um and so yeah we need to we need to break that apart and find tools which can help us in those situations which i think now town and vr language learning in general can can bring along i i had not at all to the same severity but a similar experience when i was in japan uh, last week and I, I know the Japanese word for uh, like bag at the cash register. Um, and yet every single time some one of the cashiers was asking me if I wanted a bag, I'd be like, sorry, what did you say? What was it? What was that? And I was like, mm -hmm. I've realized that when I learned the word for bag, I learned a very clear singular pronunciation from it from one experience mm -hmm. whereas um, and this is what we do in Namtown, we put in four voices for every object. 
um, um, because you don't like it, well, there isn't one sound for a word, right? Everyone, the sounds that everyone produces for the words that we're saying is are slightly different between people, between dialect, but even just between individuals and how fast you slow them or whether they're looking at you. So I think it is, yeah, super important to kind of uh, create that uh, holisticness um, of of listening. Um, but back to your question, which was uh, about um, when that changeover happens. One of the amazing things that we've seen, and it was when I first realized that something's really exciting here, was we took a, someone from Chile and we put him, so his first language was Spanish and his, uh, his second language was English, and we put him in to learn Japanese. And when he came out, he was like, ah, oh, I, um, I, I learned the, the Japanese word for, uh, what is it, that thing you do where you're, I mean, I know the Spanish word, but what's the English word where you do that, like in a cup? And he had to, he couldn't remember the English word. He, like the, the game took him from Spanish directly to Japanese through no mm. mediating or word there was no Spanish in the game so he was literally just experiencing the action and turning that into the Japanese word um and so that was like a real moment for me it's like okay when we're, we're not translating things here if we can do this with these kind of actions in virtual reality then people are not forming some kind of intermediary uh, mediating mm. language translation what they're going is straight from experience to outcome which I think is Fascinating. And you can extrapolate that even further, right? Because you can go, like in lots of places, say again, uh, Japanese because it's the language I'm strongest with. Um, before you start eating, you say this word as a sort of ritual. You always do it when you're around um, people, itadakimasu. And um, in like, when you learn that on paper, you, you sit down in Japan and like, oh, I have to, to say this thing and I will say this thing and this is what happens. And there's no direct translation. You just know that you're written it as a ritual. But when you put it into a gamified system like virtual reality, people can like immediately be like, oh, look, everyone else is saying this. This is what I should say. This is what just forms the process of this interaction. It's no longer a sense of translation. It's a sense of just action. And I think that's what is fascinating about what virtual reality can bring to language learning, especially, but all types of learning, I feel. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much for being so kind and expanding on those particular, you know, experiences from a real, real learning languages perspective. Um, in terms of noun town, what were the because now we understand that like, you have all the background of the the natural ways to learn languages, which is amazing. But now creating noun town is another complexity, I guess, that adds because it is design and development in another media, which is VR. How did you go around building the whole thing? What were the main challenges? I guess there might have been so many, but if you could choose a couple, the most complex ones or relevant ones uh, yeah. in the design process, the design and development process of the app. Yeah, um, so many challenges, um, <laughs> but I will I will keep to the, the most impactful ones. Um, one of them was the it's kind of the, the language that we were teaching, like the corpus, the amount of language we were teaching, because um, there's some very prescribed sense of what you should learn as a language learner. But equally, uh, when we were putting together this world that you exist in and move around in, some of those didn't really make much sense. Like, for example, you're often taught as a beginner to talk about your family. It's not very often as a beginner using the language in a context that you talk about your family, right? You don't go, you don't meet someone for the first time and be like, oh, nice to meet you. By the way, who's your parents? That never seems to happen. <laughs> so deciding what was appropriate and worked with virtual reality and also was helpful for beginner learners was the, the first major challenge we had was going, okay, what is appropriate to this medium and also still uh, usable for people? Um, so that was an interesting first step. Uh, the second one was uh, how we did, most of the game is speech driven. And so how we did voice recognition, how we did voice recognition, and then checking to see if what people said was correct and where we draw the line between correct and not correct. Um, so if you think about words like bath or bath, as some people in England say, like a tub that you get into bathe. Um, there are different pronunciations for the same word, which actually, when you think about it, they're quite different. Like bath and bath are almost like very far apart in terms of how they sound to a speech recognition process. So how far do we draw 
the line. If we're too forgiving, then we're allowing people to mispronounce things. If we're very strict, we're going to alienate people and also we'll mark people as incorrect for, for no apparent reason. So doing the automated tools, how do we go about making those automated tools make correct decisions like a human would in that context? Um, so that was an interesting challenge. And then the one of the other big ones was sort of just developing the the entire the entire world and also making trying to find ways in which we can make this world one performant on a quest two because the quest two is an amazing console it does amazing things but also it's very different to a pc and much less powerful yeah. um, as i'm sure all of the students who are listening to this know um and also how we kind of design interesting games that deal with learning and deal with playing and turn those into a process of helping people learn while also doing those tasks which are suitable. Um, so one example is we teach about 75 verbs in the scenes and each of those verbs is almost like its own mini game. You have to, like when you cut something, you have to pick up a knife, you have to cut an object. When you make a blender, you have to grab a, an apple and uh, some other fruit and throw it in the blender and then push the blend button. Um, so there were all kinds of separate, tiny little actions that you have to take that we had to program and make sure they were working. And um, some of those are more intense than the others and how we balance that across uh, across uh, all the different possible hands, headsets and their controllers and the systems that run those. So kind of a few few different big challenges, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. When you mention about the recognition to determine if the pronunciation is right or wrong, what particular tools do you use for that? Is it artificial intelligence or what, what type of tools and in what engine did you use uh, to, to do this? Yeah, so we, our speech recognition is done using the uh, Meta Voice SDK, oh, okay. um, which is then powered yeah. by Voice AI. Um, I, we actually at the start used um, their speech recognition tool where it would try and match people's uh, speech to words in their database. But that uses a combination of lookups. It kind of tries to listen to the word phonetically, but then also it tries to put it in a semantic sentence. So singular individual words were really difficult for it to, to understand. Um, and then eventually we spoke to them about it and they were like, oh, we could probably form a system where we turned off the syntactic lookup. So now the system we use only tries to listen and recognize the audible phonetics and then returns what it thinks it's heard. And then we take that and we apply some uh, transforms on the data to kind of match uh, what the system thinks it's heard with the word in our database and also calculate the distinction between those and how, how close or far away they are. And then we have a threshold which varies based on word about what is acceptable or not acceptable. Um, so there's a couple of separate processes that goes on for our system to go, you've said the word correctly, or I don't know the word is, word is wrong. Yeah, wow, amazing. How big is your team creating all of this? So it, it varies. We have, uh, how many people do we have? We had three full-time staff in, for the last year. Um, and then there was me who was uh, full-time, but also doing my PhD. So not, not like always at my best during that period. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of contractors who are out with uh, character artwork, um, animations, illustrations, UI, marketing, uh, language teachers to write the lessons that are in the game, uh, translators to translate the language for the objects, uh, checkers to make sure they're correct, voice actors. I mean, every word is voice acted four times. So in each of the six languages that we have in the game, um, so that's 24 extra people. Um, and then we have other voice actors to voice the characters because all the dialogue that characters speak is in your target language. None of it is in English because we want to really immerse people there. Um, we had a writer to do all the funny little dialogue for all the different characters. Um, so it, I think it is up to like 60 contractors in total. Wow, amazing. So did you have to... A, a create invest, investment campaigns or how did you did you raise funds yeah so we we had a kickstarter um early on we invested a lot of our own money um because we thought it would be a would be an interesting project that we think would work out um then we had a kickstarter which helped and got us a higher profile um 
And then we had a, a couple of private investors who mm -hmm. saw the potential in it and they thought, okay, this is, yeah, you should go for this. Good luck. Make it better. That's what they yeah. kind uh, of were getting at. And so we, we tried to make it as, as good as possible. Amazing. Congratulations. It's super, super awesome to see that these uh, type of um, platforms are out there available and, um, you know, allowing people, I know the struggle to actually create a better life maybe for some is that impactful like it was for me so it pretty much can change the someone's life um the last thing that i was going to ask you is that you have a very nice feature in the in the app which is the color as you learn i think that is super beautiful <laughs> how did you come about that and uh, was it very difficult the implementation it's super fun i really actually because of that as well i invite anybody to go and have fun at now in town. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, that's been really well received. It's kind of a, a wow factor for, for people. And honestly, that was one of the first things that that we uh, kind of decided when we made the game. We were like, okay, how how can we show people's progress in a way which is interesting and fun and and motivating? And that, like, it's honestly kind of it was quite easy I think for us to come up with that uh, color metaphor because that is kind of how it feels right when you start to learn a language like you really feel like your opportunities in that language are bringing you a brighter <laughs> newer world and so it's I feel like yeah anyone uh, anyone can come up with that idea because it was it's like I, I really think fundamentally that's how we feel about languages when we learn um, and so yeah that was that was a really nice thing. And we had a developer who came on board and he went, your circle, because so the color comes out from a central point and it used to be like quite a boring circle. And he came on board and he was like, mm -hmm. the circle could be better. And so he turned into this sort of wavy line effect, which actually gives it a lot more, a lot more life. And that's one of the big things that we really wanted to put into Nowtown. Like my PhD was in embodiment in virtual reality. And, and why what I feel very strongly is being able to pick up and manipulate things in your environment mm. is like just so important in virtual reality it makes you feel so included I played a lot of virtual reality games where you can't really touch anything except pick up the one gun and the ammo next to it and that's all you can do to interact um so along with the color we also decided that basically everything should be pick up a ball as long as it's not nailed down to the floor in the real world then you should be able to to move it around and so i think that's the the other thing that's quite exciting is that mm -hmm. you can pick up the objects they turn into color and then you can like do whatever you want with them um, so we're quite proud of that as well because it's quite a, a performance cost on the on the processes of the systems um, but we thought it was important thank you and last but not least how about the storytelling the narrative it seems that there are some very fun characters right how they were design was it someone particularly dedicated to the design of the characters or did you intervene in the process how how was it yeah so we we kind of what we started with was a whole list of uh, vocabulary that we wanted to expose across these characters because you can ask them questions in the game right you ask them questions in the language and they respond to you telling you about themselves and then wow. as you get to know them it also unlocks more casual chats we kind of got these two systems one is the direct questions you ask them and they give you answers like what do you like oh i like table tennis mm -hmm. and then once you ask them enough questions it unlocks their other dialogues which are slightly more fun and free and they'll tell mm -hmm. you things like oh, i'm quite a shy person but i like singing and so sort of like these other types of vocabulary and we've got these yeah, multiple systems um and so we started with these characteristics and we tried to map these characteristics to uh, two people and we wanted to have a diversity of gender we wanted to have a diversity of location um, we have diversity of creatures like we have a lamp um, we have a person made out of rocks um, and we also have uh, some humanoids um, some humans um, and so we kind of went through this process of developing these these characters based on these traits and then once we developed those characters, we then had this great uh, writer uh, come in who helped like write all the dialogue for them. And we had a bit of back and forth where they created a lot of funny dialogue. And I would be like, oh, it's too complicated. Language learners will struggle with this dialogue. So can we simplify the joke? Or it would be like, this is a pun and this pun is not gonna work in mm. French. Um, there's a really, uh, for us, funny and frustrating parts where uh, there's a joke where someone's like, mm, I think you've sold out of sugar, sugar puffs. And the cash is like, yes, we have, but you could buy sugar, sugar, sugar puffs. And yeah. when we sent that off to translators, they'd be like, oh, it looks like they've 
written sugar puffs too many times. They then change mm. it down. And then we kind of had to reconstruct the joke and we uh. understand, reconstruct the, the meaning and, and all kinds of things. Um, so yeah, we had to, basically we had a very good writer, and then we had me who went along trying to make everything less funny but slightly more understandable. Yeah, wow, amazing! There are so many nuances, and uh, of course, it's super complex. It's a super complex process, and the reason why we bring this to the podcast uh, is because we really want to know who are the humans behind all of this work? What are all of these uh, incredible things that happen behind the scenes? And so people can enjoy even more the app understanding all the beautiful work that happens to make that possible. Yeah, well, you know what I would add to that? We've had so many people who have volunteered their time, whether it's playtesting or making music or donating their efforts in translation early on or voice acting or just like giving feedback when the game was really buggy and terrible. And even now, once we've released and some people are like, oh, the game isn't loading for us. And they're really patient and kind. And so I think it's not just, uh, this sounds like a terrible cliche, but it's not just the development team, but it's also the people who are passionate and interested about it oh, and amazing. get involved, which which make a huge difference. And I can't, I, I can't tell you how much it means to everyone on the team when someone comes back and says, this has made my language learning so much better or, oh. or more efficient or just, oh, I really see the huge potential in this. Mm -hmm. um, it's it kind of like buoys us for weeks at a time. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much. As a second language uh, learner myself, I'm going to give a try to perhaps Japanese and French, which are my two ones that I like to start exploring. So I'll be making some uh, short videos about that, how my experience is recording and sharing in social media. I'll be tagging you. And if anybody else find this as fun, interesting, please help us to share uh, the news about downtown and how it can be used to learn languages easier and fun. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Jack. It's been an amazing conversation. I wonder if there is anything else that you wish I had asked you today. Uh, yeah, thank you, Diana. That, it has been an amazing conversation. I love that you're able to share your own testimonies about language learning. It's, it's so great. Um, yeah, one thing I would have, uh, I think would be an interesting question to ask would be how can um, like new developers or even just like uh, fans of virtual reality help support uh, kind of novel or more interesting virtual reality experiences? Because um, I feel like, okay, first person shooters are, are quite well covered in virtual reality. Um, but some of your guests from previous episodes, for example, they're doing really interesting and amazing things. And it's it's really like the, the power of a, a good review on an app store, for example, is transformative. Um, like there are loads of hidden algorithms that run. And if like I could, like I'm guilty of it myself, I'll use an app, I'll like it. And then I just won't take the effort to like actually make a review. I'm like, someone else will do that, it's fine. But it's like, not only do the game designers read all of those, but the, the like the, the good quality reviews and highly rated reviews make a complete difference to where the game appears, mm -hmm. um, how people buy it. And that makes a huge difference to the, the ongoing development. So I would, in encourage anyone that if they like a game to please take the effort to to leave a nice comment I've, i in fact having just said this on uh, your podcast i am now going to go review some of the games that i should have reviewed in the past <laughs> yes, guilty yes, of being yes. a hypocrite right here. yeah yeah we have we have to we have to Walk the talk, yeah, we have to do it. Yes, and myself, thank you so much for that reminder. Uh, I think that is super, super great that you mentioned it. We really are enjoying it. We just like forget about everything else. It's just about ourselves in our process, but we need to understand also the impact that what we are doing have even in the people that is behind all of these teams and all of these people depending on the growth <coughs> of this um, company of the app and of the experience so thank you so much for that reminder i appreciate it a lot and i'm gonna put a note actually by the way in the in the in the notes in the show notes uh, reminding or uh, with the link for downloading the app to leave the review thank you jack great thank you so much and thank you for the podcast it's like so nice to have this kind of media around for for the vr community or the xr community i should say mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that as well. Thank you so much and see you in the next episode. Bye for now.